How are you? Good evening. Welcome to, uh, where are we, Thursday? I have no idea what day it is anymore. Thursday evening, uh, back at uh, Sussex Wildlife Trust TV. And congratulations, you've made it through another month of this, uh, uh, of this craziness. But um, we're here for uh, episode 10, episode 10 of Nature Table Live. Now, uh, um, I was on my own the other night, but um, please, hopefully, hopefully I'll be joined tonight uh, by my colleagues. So, um, James, James, are you out there tonight? I'm here, Michael. How are you doing? Evening, James. How are you? All right. I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, OK. Not too bad. I feel quite yeah. chipper tonight. Usually I'm quite miserable, aren't I, when I do this sort of thing? But, you are uh, really, like miserable. really miserable, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that. And uh, uh, Dr Barry Yates, are you, uh, you over there in Rye? Yeah, I'm here, Michael. Perhaps it's spring that's cheered you up. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe. Maybe it's, or maybe it's this gin. No, it's, actually, it's, it's just water. It's just water. <laughs> and Charlotte, are you, uh, are you out there in internet land? Here I am. Yes, hello. Oh, sure. That's that <laughs> well, very smooth. So how are we? Was this just, um, is this working? Look, let's have a look. Press that. Oh, it's working, look. So yeah, welcome. Let's say it's, it's episode 10. Episode 10 on Nature Table. They said it wouldn't last, but uh, here we are, 10 episodes later, and we're still going, still going strong. A lot of people join us tonight, so good evening to everybody. And good evening, especially if you're, uh, if it's the first time you've uh, you've joined us. Um, and what happens tonight? Where's the, uh... oh yeah. I always ask people how they are, of course. Now, the big question this, though, this, um, Wait a minute, how, how do I do that? I, took, I forgot how to do it now. I was over here, look. <laughs> um, press this. Now, here we are. Now, instead of asking how you are, what I want to know is, um, have, you, have you had your COVID jab yet? That's the question. Um, James, you had your jab yet? No. Barry? Very nearly. I went to Eastbourne, but the booking hadn't worked. So I've got to go again on Sunday. Oh, no. Right. Uh, Charlie, you... Uh, uh, no, no jab for me. Oh, I've had my jab. I had my jab back in the middle of February. I think, uh, <laughs> I think because I'm classified, I'm classed as a national treasure these days. I think they had to. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> they got me in early. Let's see. Uh, let's see how the people. Oh, let's have a look. So we have now we end the polling. We'll do that and share results. Can you see that on the screen? Uh, oh, yeah. There we are. So, yeah. well, most people it seems, sixty-seven percent oh. of people have had their jabs and. Uh, 33% uh, oh. haven't. I know a lot of people watching tonight actually under under 12 years old, which could explain the um, <laughs> low number there. But uh, well, look, it's, it's, we're, it's all coming, folks. We're, hopefully next time we ask this, we'll be, we'll be on 100%. And uh, um, we'll be, we're be we heading, heading out of this. Heading out of it. Now let's uh, stop that. Hey, Michael, can, yes. can, I just, can I just interrupt? There's yes. a few people asking on the uh, Q&A about your appearance on uh, Harry Potter, A History of Magic this evening. Wow, that was, that was a... This, this evening is it, is it on the TV. Well, people are saying just watch you on BBC Two. Well, I'll get around. Yes, that's um, uh, that's another story. But yes, I was on uh, I was on a uh, Harry Potter history of magic many years ago. I wasn't aware it was repeated. But every now and again, I get phone calls and emails from my friends in New Zealand or Canada. Said I just saw in the TV. So uh, um, I don't I didn't get paid for that. I should have got some royalties out of that, shouldn't I? Perhaps I should have gone for a. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure what J.K. Rowling got paid, but uh, a lot more than me. But um, no, that's nice to know. Oh, so you see me twice this evening, so uh, brilliant. Well, um, well yeah, face, there's, there's, face, though. There's, actually, the fact is, I've never, I never, I never read one Harry Potter book in my life. I've no idea why they asked me. I haven't read Harry Potter at all. I don't, I'm not sure what happens. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I, I know he's some sort of wizard, isn't he, or something? But anyway, um, let's have a look. So uh, yeah, as, as Barry pointed out, there's a little Q and A function there. You can uh, ask any questions as as we go along, make any comments. Uh, if you do see me on TV uh, while you're watching this as well, then please let me know. Um, we'll try and answer some questions. It's a bit tricky trying to answer questions and, and do this at the same time, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. So it should be a little Q&A function somewhere on your screen. So uh, here we are. Just I was looking back, it's been, well, this time last year, I looked at the headlines on March the 4th, 2020. And look at this, look, in the independent virus risk rises. There were 13 new cases this time last year. But just, just new cases, amazing. Uh, you know, and uh, as Boris said, I don't always agree with Boris, uh, but uh, he did say the virus will get worse before it gets better. Well, it certainly did, didn't it? So, uh, uh, but that was just 12 months ago. Seems, uh, seems a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And it seems a lifetime ago that we were, mm. we were here. So uh, it's been, we were, I think we were sent home on March the 15th, 16th, sorry, March the 16th. So. So, I mean, I usually I sit next to James every day. I've seen you once, James, I think, haven't I, in a, in a year? One time, yeah. Yeah, one time. I haven't, seen Charlotte. 
been a good side to it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen. I think last time. I think I remember you was after you after you left Charlotte after you were sort of sent um, after we got we got sent home. I, I nipped into your office. And I stole your um, book on Britain spiders. Yeah. Um, you can see it's got it's got wild core written. So I think when you go back, that's where it is. I still have it. I haven't opened it, of course. I'm too scared to open the uh, <laughs> open the thing. But uh, uh, it, it's in, it's on it's on my sofa if you need it. <laughs> and of course, I haven't seen I mean, you've been over in Rye, Barry, and we, we, don't do, we don't see you always too often anyway, but uh, you've seen even less. Well, Sam, I've, I've probably seen you more in the last year than I've ever seen you in the last 10 years. So uh, <laughs> you say swings and roundabouts, Barry, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I, I guess, um, you know, I didn't know what a webinar was this time last year. You know, if you talked to me about webinars, I had no idea what you're talking about. So now I'm, uh, now I'm kind of, you know, now I know a lot about webinars. Uh, and just just to point out, it's, uh, I'm doing uh, speaking of webinars. I'm doing uh, uh, just to celebrate being sent home a year ago. Uh, I'm going to just do my Corona uh, Wildlife Diaries talk. Um, looking back, also, I did a, I did a diary for 100 days uh, from uh, March the 18th, I think, all the way to June the 25th. So I thought as we head into spring, uh, I'll, I'll revisit those uh, those sightings and those those diary pages. It's a good way of uh, of uh, looking forward to what's coming what's coming in the months ahead. Um, I just said, yeah, I like a bit of nostalgia. So but looking back with Blenko uh, on, uh, on March the 16th coming up. And speaking of webinars, now, I think on, on our last um, episode nine, we were congratulating uh, Dr. Barry Yates for his successful A Year at Rye Harbour talk uh, at the end of January. So uh, Barry had a load of people tuning into that. It was a good few hundred, Barry, wasn't it? We worked out it's probably well over a thousand actual people uh, tuning in. Um, we crowned, uh, we, there he is. We, we crowned Barry the uh, the webinar king. There he is. So um, uh, I thought to uh, to celebrate. Um, I was out. I was out last month. I went to a garden centre because um, it's where I buy my clothes now. It's where I buy my clothes and food at uh, garden centres uh, these days. But I saw a little a little present, Barry. So I bought you a little gift. So I, I haven't sent it across yet, but uh, have it here. So if we, if we unwrap it, some virtual unwrapping. Ooh. And uh, I have it here. Look, there it is. Uh, I got a little hip flask. <laughs> uh, Barry, the man, the myth, the legend. So I thought you could, um, you're doing any early morning bird surveys. You put, you put your whiskey in there, get on your bike around Rye Harbour. I've got to put my own whiskey in it. Yeah, sorry Michael. about that. Yeah, oh, really yeah. Pleasing some people, is it? That's excellent. Thank you, Michael. I look forward to um, yeah. having it in the post. Speech. I'll pop in the post here, Barry. Yes, there you are. But however, we spoke too soon because. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had Ella Garrett, our colleague Ella, did a talk on marine conservation zones. And, well, she had, well, she had at least, well, she had about 900 people, I think, tuned in. There's well, well over a thousand people. She, she beat Barry's record, basically. So it's Ella is actually now the, uh, now the queen of the webinars. So actually, it probably means I've got, means I've got to buy her a hip flask as well. But, um, so well done, Ella. If you haven't seen Ella's talk, it's available on the catch-up section. It was a really good talk as well. Some fascinating wildlife off the coast of Sussex. Uh, but Barry's, Barry's big comeback. Here's your chance, Barry. Uh, uh, just to realise that Barry's double booked himself on Tuesday, April the 6th. So hopefully um, <laughs> you'll attend your own talk, Barry. You, you need to get those numbers up. So uh, it's, your, it's your chance to get revenge on Ellis. So um, this is a members only talk for members of uh, the Wildlife Trust and, and friends of Rye Harbour. Uh, and so if you, if you join us on the 6th of April, hopefully we can... Uh, we can get Barry on into the sort of two or three thousand mark, I guess, for his for his talk. Yeah, have you uh, is all prepared, Barry? Ready to go? Um, it's just going to be about twenty five percent of the previous talk. All right, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you try don't say that. You know, you must be trying to pull the punters in. No, it's going to have some exclusive um, new video clips and um, photographs I haven't taken yet. Fantastic. That, that's more like it. Brilliant. Well, look forward to that. Um, Tuesday, April the 6th. You can book all these. There'll be a little link at the end of the, uh, the webinar this evening. And uh, you know, when I was away the other week, um, uh, James did a talk with Charlotte uh, hosting. How did that go? Uh, yeah, it went well. <laughs> you can't remember. It was too yeah. long ago. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was really good. I blocked it out. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, we, we had a few <laughs> technical issues didn't we, at the beginning, but uh, once that was resolved, yeah. all, all was good. Brilliant. It was the only talk I've actually haven't been involved with so far. Uh, there's been this is our thirty first talk tonight. It was the only talk I haven't been involved with so far. So when I saw this comment, um, 
I've watched a few SWT <laughs> webinars in, this year, and this was definitely <laughs> the best so far. I, I took oh. it slightly, slightly personally, but um, I still need to some it. lovely, it's lovely feedback. Really, yeah. The lovely feedback. And we've been getting some lovely emails from people. So I, I, it's thank you for your feedback and donations. It's been fantastic. So thank you very much for all who've been supporting uh, uh, these little talks. Was that a quote from James Duncan? It was. Okay. Very good. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I've been working as well. So I, did some, I did my MOFS talk, uh, which was great. And um, I thought it was great anyway. And I did my nocturnal wildlife talk the other day. It's funny because I'm always telling people to keep it short. 45 minutes is the maximum. <laughs> And then I go and talk for an hour and 20 minutes, but um, I think, I, I think uh, people stayed awake anyway. Uh, which reminds me, Barry, because during that talk the other night, um, someone asked me, I had a, I was talking about bitterns at Rye Harbour. Yeah. And uh, I played, because uh, I, I went there years ago and I heard bitterns there. Actually, I've got the call of a bittern here. Is, um, if I play it now, this is uh, the booming call. Hold on to your hats, here we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember Barry told me years ago, you can, you can, you can feel it in your bones when they start making that noise. But uh, uh, someone asked, when's the best time to come and hear the booming bitterns at Rye Harbour, Barry? Uh, May May's the best month, but they'll, they'll be starting towards the end of March. But the, again, um, evening or early morning is best, but on a nice calm May day, they'll be booming all through the day. Brilliant. Okay, well, I'm definitely, if I'm allowed, are we allowed? But if, if I'm allowed, I'll come over to, uh, to Rye Harbour. I could bring your little hip flask over. I can, uh, they're probably empty. It'd definitely be empty if I do that. But, um, and also, uh, just from, from, last, from last month's um, Nature Table Live, I've got an apology to Charlotte because uh, a shark put together an incredible video of the wood mice in her uh, in her greenhouse, the crazy antics of the uh, the wood mice, and there was an amazing intro she made to that little clip. But I didn't know I didn't see it when I downloaded it. So uh, and uh, so I've, I've been I'm just gonna play the intro now to, to last month's episode. Um, I've been it's because it's because I love it so much, and also I've been humming this tune, I've been whistling this tune for uh, the mm -hmm. last few weeks. So uh, here we are. This is uh, Charlotte's intro to her wood mice uh, epic. <laughs> Anyway, that's, I love that. So we have, we have episode two coming up later on, so you can just watch the intro again later on. But uh, <laughs> 90s sitcom theme music, I, I can imagine. Amazing. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. So, um, so thank you, Shot. So we've got uh, episode two later on. You may recall last uh, um, last month, I made an absolute mess of uh, getting the uh, these videos on the screen. So you have that to look forward to as well. Um, watch me struggling near the end of the uh, episode. So uh, we have our Facebook page, uh, Nature Table a Facebook page where people leave their sightings and uh, and photographs. So uh, I troll through those every month and look at some of the more interesting or, or the better photos or just the ones I like. And uh, we stick them on this uh, this webinar. So uh, we're still we're still in a sort of lockdown. So a lot of people are still photographing wildlife uh, from their garden. So uh, of course we had that snow uh, just after uh, last episode nine. I think just the start of uh, start of February. There's a some lovely, I love snow, some lovely snow. Nice picture by Barry here of uh, a blue tit. Um, a great picture here by Mike, Michael Howard, everyone's favorite uh, garden bird, the, uh, uh, the sparrowhawk. Look at that. Look at those eyes, look. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, there's a, lots of jays around at the moment. Um, I still get emails from my friends claiming they've seen a parrot in the garden, but uh, um, it's, it's, always, it's always a jay, always a jay. And look at this lovely picture by Louise here. Uh, of a beautiful barn owl uh, in the snow a few months back. Gorgeous. And there's still some winter birds around. Um, some pictures here of uh, a red wing. Uh, people are still seeing red wing. They should be uh, thinking about heading north again soon. And uh, Moy was very lucky to have uh, a brambling in her garden. I, I haven't seen a brambling. Have you seen a brambling over, over the winter, James? No, not one, unfortunately. I've been keeping my eyes out for them, looking amongst the chaffinches, but um, no, not a single one. You've been hearing them over your house, Barry, haven't you? I can't hear a thing. I've got oh. my hearing aids in. Oh, fair <laughs> enough. Okay, but um, 
yeah, so it was, it was well put them in for, uh, for next year, perhaps. Um, over at Rye, also over at Rye, uh, James photographed um, a pair of lovely spoonbill. Are they still around over there, Barry? Yeah, we had four today. Brilliant, lovely. Uh, uh, Barry sent a video. Now, I hope this plays. Now, here are some oyster catchers, and I've put, some, I've put the photographs after the video, Barry, so you may want to talk about it after the, uh, after the clip. So let's see this plays, all right? Okay, so this trail camera is positioned in amongst the regular oyster catcher high tide roost. Watch the bird on the right come in. Got, oh, no, don't watch this oyster catcher because he's just going to, there's some widgeon flying over its head. There we are, oyster catcher just emptying. And this bird had colour rings on. And were, were you quick enough to read them? I suspect the quality of the video over this link's not good enough, but I was able to extract some photographs. So there's a, a green ring hiding above the, um, the false knee, high up on the leg. There's a metal ring above the left um, false knee, and then a pale green ring with Q on it, and then a red ring with Z on it. And that's an individual identification for this bird. So it was ringed as a chick. Um, just north of Amsterdam. There we are, looking a bit, getting attacked by the bird on the right there. But it was ringed as a chick in 2018, in June 2018. So it probably, oh, can you see the white ring around its neck? Um, they, they have that in the winter and the young birds hang on to them. So it may not um, be old enough to breed. So it might hang around Rye Harbour all summer long, or it might go back to Amsterdam and still not try and breed. They're long lived birds. And uh, it's just a reminder that um, what we think of as our birds uh, um, are really everybody's birds. And we need to have a string of places for these migratory birds to um, survive um, along the uh, north south um, migratory flyway. So there we are. That's the that's the oyster catcher. You, it's funny. It's, it's quite a nice little link, Barry. You mentioned about birds surviving uh, on migration. Well, this one uh, obviously didn't. Um, uh, John mm -hmm. sent a picture in of these uh, pair of wings here, um, and uh, he asked he asked uh, what they were. He thought it could be a kestrel, but uh, a lot of people on the Facebook page uh, identified this as a as a woodcock. Um, and uh, there's, there's some woodcock. There's a woodcock wings there. So. Yeah, so as you say, Barry, these birds, you know, it's a, it's tough. This migration thing, this migration lark's pretty tough. Not, not all of them survive. It is. And during that very cold weather at, uh, in the beginning of February, a lot of birds moved out of Europe and crossed the North Sea. Um, I can remember I had, I had a lovely sighting. I'd gone for a long walk around the reserve on a cold day, snowy day. Hadn't seen much, surprisingly walked into my back garden and there was a woodcock just strolling around and then it, it, it flew off. But quite a lot were find, found along the coast, um, bodies and, and, and the remains, of the wings. So a large number didn't make it. Um, and that's just how nature works. Survival of the fittest. Here's, um, I have a cold woodcock here, of course. So those of you who watched early episodes of Nature uh, Table Live, remember this guy here, uh, he's been in my deep freeze. Next to the uh, next to the pizzas, uh, there he is. There, I forgot his name. If, if, if Isla's out there tonight, if Isla's uh, watching tonight, well, was it William the Woodcock? It was Harry the Hawfinch, wasn't it? The frozen Hawfinch was Harry, and uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure the Woodcock was William. But because um, uh, I remember we, we measured his beak, didn't we, Barry, to work out if it was male or female? I remember that. Yeah. Um, Somebody uh, said it was William. Apparently, it yeah. was. But yeah, thank you, it thank is. you very much. So. Uh, um, I was, about, I was about to pull its wing out, but it's, it's quite frozen. It, I'll, I'll probably snap it off. So uh, I'll put it back in the fridge with a pizza in a minute. <laughs> we'll leave him here. Oh, I'll let him over there for a minute. Get back, in, get back in your bag. Get back in there. So, still wriggling around. Um, I'm still back at Rye Barry. There's a picture here uh, by James Tomlinson. Now, uh, there's Barry's new house at the bottom, the, uh, the, the, the Rye Harbour Discovery Centre. It's Barry's extension. Um, how's that coming on, Barry? Is it uh, almost finished? 
yeah, I was in there today for the first time in a few months and it looks fantastic inside. The interpretation's all sorted. Um, the final fit out's taking place. The, in that photograph, the blue hoardings have come down. And uh, yeah, really exciting times. Uh, I mean, I mean, James wasn't photographing the, uh, uh, the building works. He was actually photographing the, the, bird, the bird at the top there. Do um, you recognize that one, James? Yeah, Marsh Harry up here there, very nice. Well, that's what James thought as well as what James Tomlinson thought as well. But uh, when he's being zoomed a bit closer, it turned out it was a hen harrier. Look at that. There you go. <laughs> it looks really long winged as well. Yeah. yeah. Especially that bird at the top. So yeah. I love you to see, love you to see it again. There's a hen harrier there. Fly. Just having a, a quick peek at the uh, Rye Harbour Discovery Centre. Lovely. Yeah, so it, when it, I, it when I, uh, Michael, when I first came to the reserve, hen harriers were, were very common during the winter. Um, this is in the last century, um, and they've now become a great rarity. We only we only see them on perhaps four or five days of the year now. Right. So that was a, a, a great sighting for James, and he's always got his camera with him. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Um, another picture by James here, just uh, again over at uh, over at Rye. I love cormorants, absolutely love. Look at that. So when when they at this time of year they get into their sort of courtship, sort of breeding plumage. Um, I mean, look at that. It's a stunning bird. It's like a dinosaur, isn't it? Look at it. And that, that's a special cormorant. That's not a British cormorant. That's a continental cormorant. And they tend to have much whiter heads. They nest earlier and they tend to nest in trees. So most of our breeding cormorants are the uh, sinensis continental cormorants. But given it, I always get its full name, of course, it's great cormorant is the name of the species and always uh, make sure we should... Uh, that certainly is a great cormorant there. Absolutely fantastic. I, I, I do love cormorants. Are you a cormorant fan, Charlotte? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Just just making sure, just checking. We don't want any, any cormorant uh, dislikers in here. And they're, def um, they're definitely not black. Look at that. I mean, it's just amazing. I love them. In fact, I love them so much, I put them on the front of my new book, which is uh, available now to pre-order. There we are there. Look at uh, um, but, um, that. That's, a, that's the, this is an extinct cormorant on the front there. That's the... Uh, Technical cormorant. I had my first review today. I was quite pleased. I've got a review in the uh, prestigious um, uh, journal, the uh, the Swansea, uh, the Bay, Swansea's Free Lifestyle Magazine. So someone removed the review. <laughs> the Swansea are going to be loving my book over there. He said, uh, every now and again, a book comes along that is so irresistibly charming that uh, you just put your feet up and read it in one sitting. It's quite, it took me a year to write that. People read it in one sitting. It's quite a long <laughs> book. I'm not sure how fast that's a hitch actually reads. Not so, she's actually quite a, a quick reader, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, it's, it took me a long time to write that. And read it once, it put your feet up, but uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it anyway. Um, and here's another, another great cormorant, a uh, photograph by Isfan, this time down at Brighton Marina. I just love his, um, love, love the feet on this, this picture here. Yeah, not stunning, absolutely stunning, absolutely gorgeous. And also, Isfan photographed some, um, uh, uh, some common seals down there at Brighton Marina as well. This one here, look at that one there, look. Is it is it me, folks, or does that does that remind you of um, of that? <laughs> definitely there, isn't it? There's definitely a similarity there, isn't it? But um, uh, and it's oddly enough, uh, I was chatting to Nikki, who was the our special guest in last uh, uh, in last month's uh, uh, nature table, and she was out this morning uh, swimming with some seals just off Brighton. Uh, that, that's not her on the right, by the way. Um, <laughs> swimming along there, but uh, she was out swimming with seals. So it's a lovely picture. And this lovely picture by, by Paul of uh, uh, a common seal, harbour seal, contemplating life uh, down at Eastbourne Marina. It's a great, uh, great expression there. Now, if you love seals, I'm sure we all do. Um, now, you may recall way back, episode four or something, episode five, we had John Arnott come in and talk about uh, uh, seals. And I've asked John to come and do a whole talk about the seals of Chichester Harbour. So he's back next Tuesday. So uh, that should be fascinating. John is really passionate uh, about seals. I'm passionate about the harbour as well, so uh, there's a lot to learn from John uh, next Tuesday. Another picture by his fan, he was uh, a bit of beach, beach combing and uh, found a little crab uh, inside a mussel and um, didn't know what the species was. I took a punt on this, I, I'm no expert on crabs, but uh, I reckon it was a pea crab and I was right. Uh, luckily our, uh, our marine colleagues confirmed it, so uh, I have a new career ahead of me as a, uh, what, what do you call it, you study mollusks? Crustaceanologist. Yeah, I'd be a crustaceanologist. And we had Daryl. Uh, Daryl joined us as a guest a few months back, and he's been out in his garden 
uh, with his uh, photographing wildlife at night. It's a great picture. He said, is his closest brush, he says, with Basil, the fox. Uh, not the greatest photo, but at this point, I was, I was keeping very still in my hide while being virtually nose to nose with him. So uh, lovely picture there. And he took a great picture in the last few weeks of, uh, of badgers visiting his garden as well. And uh, here's a bit of a standoff between the, uh, the fox and the badger in the middle of suburbia. Fantastic. And uh, some of the great photographs, uh, some lovely bits of, uh, now, now the springs here. I, I just see the colors more now, now the springs here. Uh, here's a flash of yellow from a, a gray wagtail, uh, photographed by Jeff in uh, Alexandra Park. Look at this picture here, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, a fire crest, looking pretty punky there, uh, raising his uh, crest over there in the, uh, the woods of West Sussex. A nice picture of uh, In the Sunshine, by Phil Winter, they have a gold crest in song, so uh, you can't see his little gold crest, but uh, you almost hear it. Um, a lot of birds starting singing now, which is uh, ah, just great, just uh, pretty uplifting. Uh, Louise was pretty lucky. She's been pretty lucky, Louise. That she's been out with her camera. She's over there in uh, on the heaths of West Sussex. Uh, for one of my favourite warblers. Uh, it doesn't sound, you know, it's not a great song, but uh, it's certainly our most stunning-looking warbler. That big red eye, the, uh, the Dartford warbler. And bearded tits down uh, near Eastbourne. Uh, bearded reedlings, you may want to call them, but uh, they're bearded tits to me. I'm, I'm still very old school when it comes to, to these. Um, lovely birds now. I haven't seen some bearded, I haven't seen bearded tits for a long time. Do you, what's the story of these at Rye, Barry? Do you have them at Rye? Yes, they're very hard to see though. Um, you need a calm day, a good pair of ears and listen out for their ping, ping, ping call. Um, yeah, they nest here now with the reed bed creation work. So you can get bearded tits and bittens from the middle of May when we're allowed to go out. Okay, that's the plan. I did. I'll be. I'll be straight over there. Tell you middle of May. I, I, there's so many things, and I did. I did promise you, Charlotte, we're going to see the velvet scoter. But I think by the time middle of May comes around, they're going to be up in the, up in the Arctic. So um, we always we could always go up there. We want to, but uh, that's, that's probably. Yeah, that's I don't probably a trip, yeah. <laughs> yeah not, not just yet. Perhaps in the future. Let's, we'll go on a we'll go on a nature table live um, jaunt. All four of us will go off to the uh, look for velvet scoters. Sounds good. Now, just but uh, just I love uh, uh, Karen's picture here. Uh, Karen's picture of uh, a robin with a runny nose. Uh, I, I watched look at some of Karen's uh, close-up photos. Really, really clear, crystal clear images of birds. So I don't know if, you, if you're out there, Karen. If, if you're listening, I won't mind knowing what camera you've got because uh, I, 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 I need a new camera. My little rubbishy pocket thing is uh, uh, is getting on its last legs. So a uh, lovely picture of a robin there. But uh, the highlight for me this uh, this month, the last few weeks certainly, um, has been this little chap. Now this is a, a yellow ham. Now I've been living here uh, in, my, uh, in my bungalow in the middle of suburbia uh, for eight years now. And I've always wanted to, I've, I've, I've seen yellow hammers fly over, but they're not on my garden list. They haven't landed in the garden. So a few weeks back, just, an, just kind of in the garden on the tree, uh, I saw a little flash of yellow and it was a yellow hammer. I was absolutely thrilled which meant I've now seen 49 and a half bird species uh, in my garden in the last eight years. Uh, the half comes from um, this uh, half a mallard, uh, which I found in the compost. Not half a mallard, a half a mallard, uh, which I guess a fox had buried there. So I, I kind of count, it's in the garden, so I kind of counted it. Um, but I was quite pleased with this. I thought, well, one, you know, we're heading towards the 50. And uh, where's my bit of paper? It's on the floor. Look. Here's my... Here's my list. This is my garden bird list. It hides in the spot amongst the uh, next to the soy sauce. It's a bit stained in the uh, in the food cupboard. I was reviewing my list on 49 and a half. I realised I haven't counted herring gull. And herring gulls land on the roof quite a lot. So um, I'm actually on 50 and a half. So I'm pretty pleased. I'm up to 50 now. So it's taken eight years. I think the next 50 will probably take a bit longer um, to get to. But uh, I might be, I'm aiming high. I'll get, go and get to 100. Oh, come on, that's one there. But then... Then, so that this, this yellow hammer came down. So uh, I, I went and got some bird seed. I spent a fortune on bird seed. I, I just threw some bird seed on the ground and uh, I managed to uh, lure in two yellow hammers, which I was quite pleased with. There you go, look. look. Absolutely beautiful. And then a few days later, there was, there was four yellow hammers in the garden. I mean, I'm, I'm just sat here working. The problem is I've been, I've been on Zoom meetings. I've been staring out the window because I get these flashes of yellow. Um, mm. And then today, there's actually 12 yellow hammers in the garden. Now, I think there's, there's nine in this little video clip I made. Look, 
Two and count them. Right, there's one in the background there, that's one. And there's two, three, four, five, six just landed, seven, eight, nine. And there was, there was a few more in the trees. So it's amazing. I, put, I just put a bit of seed down. And also I've got to, two stock doves mm -hmm. coming as well. So we've had stock dove in the garden once. And now there's uh, just for a handful of seed. Uh, so I'm, I'll be sitting here all weekend now with my, my camera and my binoculars. So I've got to try and beat 12. Let's see how we, uh, how we go with that. Uh, some more photos from the uh, Facebook page. Uh, Moy was photographing some, uh, some buzzard action over uh, a garden in East Sussex. Great photographs of uh, buzzards getting a bit rowdy at this time of year. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we start hearing some songbirds and birds coming back uh, on migration. So, uh, James, do you want to talk about some of these uh, early arriving migrants? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, um, March obviously heralds quite a quite a good month, um, you know, for the arrival of a, a fair few birds. So, oh, who's that? Sure that was um, it wasn't me. I was Barry. Barry's to blame. <laughs> so, yeah, while well, some birds obviously are, are sort of thinking of departing our shores, others others are arriving. And as you can see from uh, Joe here, Joe's actually already well, he's already heard his first thing in chiff chaff of the year. Now, I was actually going to lead on to say that, you know, usually kind of mid-March is, is kind of the time when we start hearing sort of chiff chaffs, and they, they really are one of our very first sort of singing genuine migrants. Um, but some of you actually might have seen chiff chaff in the winter, which is uh, eminently possible because we do actually have a small wintering population. Lots of these birds tend to be in the south, and it sort of seems logical to think that, you know, there probably are breeding chiff chaffs, some of them staying here, uh, but actually it's very likely that most of the birds that stay here over winter are actually individuals that have come from sort of Scandinavia um, and Eastern Europe and they're just they're enjoying a slightly more balmy sort of English winter um, essentially but uh, most of the chiff chaffs you know they, they don't necessarily all go down to Africa uh, lots of them will kind of just go down to the Mediterranean region they're actually quite short winged um, I don't know are we should we play the chiff chaff before I move on to its kind of longer winged cousin I suppose well, we, could. A, we should we go it's, it's chiff chaff Yeah, that's it, folks. <laughs> that's yeah. as exotic as it gets. I mean, oh, still going, still going. It's launching again. Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously this is this is one of our kind of 13, uh, you know, breeding warbler species. But to be honest, the chiff chaff is, well, it's not very warbly, is it? It's not very warbly. I mean, essentially, it's just onomatopoeic. It's, it's just sort of saying its own name. Um, whereas it's very similar looking sort of cousin is actually a bit more warbly. So I don't oh, know. Yeah, that, that's... Uh... The next slide, look, I've got uh, this guy next. <laughs> Fair enough, okay. Well, maybe maybe we'll get on to it. Uh, to it. Well, we, 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 we can jump ahead, look, we can jump ahead. Well, let's, let's do, do, do black cap first. Okay, we'll do black cap, we'll do black cap. So, yeah, I mean, black cap in exactly the same way as chiff chaff, although, uh, it, you know, most of our black caps actually, of course, uh, over winter south of the Sahara or, or kind of down in Africa, uh, it's another bird that, you know, you may well have in your garden over winter. So, you know, there's perhaps a few thousand kind of uh, black cap over wintering now. Again, these are not birds that are, that are kind of choosing to stay uh, breeding birds. These are actually part of a, a sort of Eastern European or German population um, that are actually migrating to the UK and staying here over winter. Um, and of course, these birds, it means that they can get back onto their breeding grounds in Eastern Europe a lot quicker uh, than birds that have traveled all the way down to Africa. So there's a real kind of advantage, uh, you know, in, in being able to kind of proclaim uh, the best breeding territory um, sort of going back to Europe. So yeah, fabulous looking birds, obviously the male with the black cap uh, and the female with the sort of russet brown cap. So very, should very we play the, Should we play the song, James? Yeah, let's play the lovely, the fruity kind of warbling song. Let's do that. Wait a minute, here we are. Good All right, so I've got a few good. things, oh, got a few birds which uh, no one's reported yet, but they're on their way, you say, James. So I thought we'd uh, have a little uh, sneak preview of what's uh, what's heading our way. So uh... excellent, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, oh, what a beautiful bird the wheat ear is! Really, really beautiful. So yeah, I mean, the wheat ears. They this, has there been any wheat ears recorded at Rye Harbour yet, Barry? Any sightings? What? Not yet. 
No, yeah, it's a little bit early. It's a little bit early. So, you know, wheat tears are going to be arriving throughout March, but really it's kind of the end of March when, when the numbers really pick up. Um, now, our part of kind of England, the southeast actually is, is, is really kind of rare for breeding wheat ear. So most of the birds will be kind of breeding in, in the west and the north of the UK. Uh, but, you know, we do have uh, some pairs breeding at Rye Harbour, which is fantastic, of course. Um, yeah, they're really, really long distance migrants, folks. I mean, you know, we all think of like the Arctic Turn or, as kind of the longest distant migrant. But, you know, the wheat ear really is our, our kind of longest distance song, songbird. You know, it just it travels just a, an absolutely phenomenal distance. Um, and actually, although some of the wheat ears are going to be kind of arriving in March and maybe sort of moving on a little bit further into the UK, We'll probably get some other birds arriving a little bit later in spring and these birds probably won't stay in the UK. These are ones that are going to be on their route to sort of Greenland and, and, and even Alaska um, and they're, they're a slightly kind of larger subspecies and some of these birds are going to be completing journeys of I mean like 10,000 kilometers plus probably 10 to 15,000 kilometers something in that region. Um, so it's a really really phenomenal journey. And, uh, you know, they're a very distinctive bird. They've obviously got these long black legs. Uh, they stand really sort of upright as well. They kind of, you know, tend to kind of run around on, on sort of short turf uh, looking for insects. So, yeah, fantastic bird. So keep your eyes peeled for those folks. Normally, we'd be doing guided walks as well uh, in sort of April time, wouldn't we, Michael? Looking. For... Yeah, we usually do a nice welcoming in the wheat ears. A gentleman yeah. in the back has a question. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I wondered if you, you could tell people why they're called wheat ears. Oh, well, I wasn't sure whether I should, Barry, because... No, I'm, I'm not sure whether you should either, because it's, it's a family show, Barry. Do you it's think... a family can, show. Can I? Can I? Can I do it? I don't know. I mean, what time is it? Is it past? It's, 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 well, it's not too... I know, there, there's, there's, I know there's children watching. Uh, perhaps we'll, perhaps we'll, do a, we'll, do a, we'll do an adult version of, this, of, of the Nature Table Live one night after 10 o'clock or something, after the watershed. It's not uh, too... It's not too... It's, it's, not, it's not too blue. It's not too rude, but... Uh, it's not too um, rude. I've gone, James. Just... I mean, oh, they, they, they children can close their ears now, but so <laughs> this is not that rude. Yeah, so essentially one really distinctive feature with the wheat ear is its rump, uh, which is, let's kind of think of it as its backside, essentially. Um, and the, wheat, the name wheat ear actually comes from kind of an old English uh, version, which essentially means white arse, everybody, white arse. There we are, so they're, they're white arse. So look for, I, its, I, look for its white arse, basically, it's very distinctive. I, 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 still, I still call them that when I see them, so... Uh, um, <laughs> Barry, how many pairs do we have at uh, Rye Harbour? It fluctuates between about five and a dozen pairs. It's part of a population that we share with Dungeness and possibly the French coast, but it's, it's very isolated and so is vulnerable to um, extinction. So Chris, um, one of the wardens here, has been cleaning out their nest boxes because they nest underground, sometimes in rabbit burrows, sometimes in our nest boxes. Okay, that, that's uh, and here's the one you were talking about, James. Uh, yeah, the willow warbler. Yeah, so, we should we should we should have discussed this, shouldn't we, before I started uh, sort of trying yeah. to try talk about it, really. But never mind. Yeah, um, I think we could try and rehearse, but uh... yeah, actually, well, this is a this is the perfect photo to demonstrate what I was going to talk about, and that essentially is is looking at the length of the willow warbler's wings. So if you're looking at these these long sections of wing pointing down. Essentially, this is the extent of the primary wing feathers, the primary projection. And these are actually a lot longer than they are on chiff chaff. So, you know, I'm sure some of you are thinking, God, that you know, the willow warbler and the chiff chaff, they look exactly the same. And they are quite difficult to split. There are a few features that are different, but essentially, unless you get a really close view, uh, it can be quite difficult. But the reason the willow warblers actually have these longer wings is because they're uh, uh, they're a slightly longer distance migrant. So whereas the chiff chaffs will tend to kind of winter around the Mediterranean, maybe some of them kind of going as far as Africa, but not, not typically, uh, the willow warblers will actually go sub-Sahara. And interestingly, some of these birds that end up sub-Sahara uh, might even start in sort of Eastern Siberia. So some of these birds, I mean, they're the size of a blue tit, they're absolutely tiny, um, you know, are going to be doing sort of 10 to 12,000 kilometer journeys. So you know, it's really, really dangerous for them. Really dangerous. But they've got a much nicer song. They're actually, they're much, we, uh, more bobbly, much more bobbly. Much more up, James. Yeah, so uh, you remember the Chiff Chaff was like that really boring Chiff Chaff, Chiff Chaff. These, these sound like this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was, lost my mouse now. Here we are, look. Here we go. <laughs> well, that feeling.
Uh, and next up, James, we've got the Sam Martin. Yeah, so I mean, the Sam Martin, uh, it's usually actually one of our earliest arriving migrants. So uh, they, they start sort of arriving throughout March. A uh, really distinctive bird. Obviously, they've got a very, very short tail, particularly in, uh, in comparison to the kind of tail streamers that the swallows have. Uh, and a really good way to differentiate them, you know, particularly from house martin uh, when you're seeing both species. Other than sort of the habitat type, uh, sand martin has this brown band that goes across the, the sort of upper breast. Uh, and on the top of the bird, it, it's sort of, you know, uniform in colour on top. Uh, but the house martins have, well, they have a white rump. They've got a white arse. Yeah, They've got yeah, a yeah, white arse, exactly well, like yeah. we did. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I think when it comes to uh, using that word, James, I, I think it was a stick to the wheat here for that. I, I, I didn't give you like, you can call every bird. <laughs> but every bird's All right. I retract. I retract. Uh, retraction now. OK. I never said it. And we've got, then uh, the swallows are coming as well. Yeah, the swallows. I mean, you know, keep your eyes out, everybody, for swallows uh, kind of through March. I mean, to be honest, most of them are probably going to be arriving from sort of late March onwards. Certainly any, any kind of individuals uh, you see before that are, are fairly early. Um, but of course, you know, those long tail streamers are very, very distinctive. It is a little bit harder later in the year, actually, because juvenile swallows have uh, rather shorter tail streamers. So unless you're quite close to them, uh, sometimes it's quite easy to confuse them for the, uh, for the shorter tailed uh, martins. But yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, okay, well, wait a minute. I've got to click on this. It's a weird thing my computer does, though. And I put a bonus one in for you, James. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, I, I love that. I mean, you know, I don't know if everybody is familiar with the ring ouzel. Um, essentially, for those of you who, who, who aren't and are thinking, oh, it's, a, it's a, just a very strange looking blackbird. Well, essentially, the ring ouzel is, a, is really a mountain blackbird. So, you know, we're, we're not actually lucky enough to have kind of breeding ring ouzel in this part of the country. Um, this is a bird essentially the breeds in the kind of uplands, uh, you know, of, of England and Scotland. But the great thing is, of course, they have to pass through our counties uh, to get there. So from the end of March, you know, really keep your eyes peeled, everybody, for any unusual looking blackbirds, particularly if you live on the uh, sort of the coastal areas of Sussex uh, and Kent. We might as well say Kent as well, um, because, you know, these are really, really good areas to, to pick up sort of ring or passing through. Some of them will fly straight through, uh, but some of them will stop on coastal areas. So the males are really, really distinctive with this, this kind of um, crescent moon, this white crescent moon on, on, on the chest. They're a really, really lovely bird, but much, much shyer than the blackbird as well. So um, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Awesome. Lovely. Thank you, James. Now, um, I was chatting to Charlotte in the week and uh, Charlotte, of course, works for our wild call service. People can phone up and uh, email, ask all, sorts of, ask all sorts of questions. But this time of year, a lot of the questions Charlotte receives well, Charlotte, do you want to talk about your uh, your most popular question of the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the best time of the year, really. It's frog, frog spawn season. Um, and this is where Wildco goes absolutely crazy with all kinds of questions about frog spawn. Too much frog spawn. Not enough frog spawn. <laughs> What's going on with the frog spawn? Um, but it's brilliant. I'm always really happy to hear um, that the frogs are back. And it's one of the really nice early signs of, of spring as well, when the frogs come back to the pond and... Um, produce um, all these massive clumps of, of frog spawn. Um, well, sort of, um, uh, I mean, I know people always asking about sort of moving frog spawn around. What, what's the uh, what's the deal with that? People, so they've yeah, been sort of puddles, it's, it's drying up. And... Yeah, when, pe when people have a pond but no frog spawn, um, they're often getting in touch to say, you know, where can I get some frog spawn? Um, and basically the only way you can get frog spawn is by attracting the frogs in the first place. It's really tempting to move frog spawn around. So if you've got a friend or a neighbor with some in their pond, you might think, well, I'll just throw some into mine. Um, but um, we always advise never to do that because there's lots of really nasty amphibian diseases out there that can really devastate the local frog population. So moving the spawn around um, really does risk moving those diseases around as well, which is definitely not, not a good thing. Um, so yes, and there might be a reason why your pond doesn't have any frog spawn. Maybe there aren't a lot of frogs in the area. Maybe the pond isn't suitable for some reason. Um, frog ponds are generally quite shallow. Um, with plenty of sunlight, the frog spawn develops a lot quicker in sort of warm water. Um, so that's where the frogs like to go. And sometimes they sort of, you know, they will use any kind of water, even puddles and, and really temporary spots are very shallow. Um, taking a bit of a risk, um, hoping that they will develop fast enough to um, have emerged as little froglets by the time the puddle eventually kind of dries up. Um, so, it's been plenty, yeah. plenty of photos uh, sent into the, uh, the Facebook page. I mean, it, um, certainly around the middle of the month, we're having a load of photos sent in by uh, 
uh, by folks. But um, mm -hmm. is, is it an early year for Frogspawn or? A, um, I don't know. Some people, I mean, we were sort of, because it was very mild very early on, but then it turned um, kind of cold again. So we we're kind of expecting the frog spawn to, to turn up early. Um, but I think it's pretty lucky that most of them didn't spawn before that cold and frosty weather, because that can really damage um, any of the eggs like there are kind of above the surface of the water. If they get frozen, they're not going to survive. Um, so, I mean, frogs can spawn as early as January, depending on what, what the weather's doing. So I think it's probably about an average year so far. Um, okay. With some appearing in February and, and in March is definitely a very busy month um, for the frogs there. But I found these photos, they've got these absolutely brilliant, so you can really see an up close view of the frog spawn with the little, um, the egg itself is a little black blob in the middle of all that jelly. And the jelly is kind of um, serves to kind of provide a bit of protection, but essentially its, it's main function is to keep the eggs wet. Um, and it's, it's basically 99% water because when those little eggs are laid they come out of the female frog not like that but just the eggs on their own and they only kind of swell up um, absorb lots of water when they um, enter the pond and become this kind of little jelly blobs and you can see the little egg in the middle there the cells starting to divide and grow into a little tadpole. Wow thank you. Thank you Charlotte well uh, hopefully that's answered some uh, uh, some some folks uh, frog spawn questions it may, it may mean your phone will stop ringing uh, next week we don't know. But it won't. Sure. <laughs> 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 um, also some lovely photos on the Facebook uh, page of uh, some reptiles and uh, there's a lovely picture of a common lizard. This, this one's got lost its tail, I think. It's um, shared by Christian of a, uh, a sunbathing uh, common lizard. And also uh, you photographed a sunbathing grass snake. You can see the sort of, uh, you can't really see the yellow ring around its neck too well, but you can see the, the, those sort of black uh, stripes on its, uh, on its flanks on its side there. And you also photographed yeah, quite a few photographs of adders, and uh, this one was my favourite, staring straight at the camera with that, uh, those lovely eyes. Absolutely gorgeous animals, adders. I, I, I love adders. Look at them, absolutely beautiful. And uh, a nice picture here by, uh, by Sally, uh, taken down near, uh, near north of Brighton. Um, I think almost, almost around Valentine's Day, well, not, not quite, but a nice, nice adder, a nice heart-shaped adder there. Uh, just coming out and basking in the, uh, the first bit of warmth in 2021. But, um, my favourite reptile has also uh, has also emerged. There he is. Look, my tortoise. <laughs> He's back out. So I've uh, there's tootles. Now I've had tootles um, all my life. So uh, yeah, he's um, I think he's actually older than me. I so said it's weird to have a pet that's actually who's older than you and actually pro will probably outlive you by a few decades as well. It's um, you know, it, it's um, what is this working? Look, this look here. Look. There's me and Tootles. It looks like I'm giving birth to Tootles there. That isn't where he came from. But uh, there's me and Tootles in 1976. Uh, there, there we are. That's you know, was about four years old, five years old. Um, there's little Toots. There he is. And yeah, it's um, yeah, it's strange. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't do. He just sort of saunters around. And he, he hibernates uh, quite a lot. But uh, there he is. But he, he's come out of hibernation. Um, a month on the other day to say he's out of hibernation. Now very early. This is one of the earliest times he's come out. So uh, he isn't getting much sleep. But uh, he's been. Um, He's been a good, well, he's, he's kind of been a, been a companion to me, I guess, all my life. But he doesn't even live with me anymore. He lives down in, uh, lives down in Devon. But um, he's there, yeah. It's just, I say, it's weird to have a pet that actually uh, is probably going to outlive you, uh, which is quite strange. Uh, but I did actually dedicate my, uh, my new book. My new book is actually dedicated to my, uh, my tortoise. There it is. Look, so uh, there's a dedication there. So I dedicate my book to my tortoise, uh, to Tootles. But he's out. So he's out now. So, uh, well, you know. It's always a good sign. He's got through another winter, uh, just just as we have. Um, but other animals emerging too, not just uh, not just my tortoise. But uh, uh, Barry, you've been uh, you've been hearing some bats. Yes, I've. Um, <clears throat> Rye Harbour is very good for, for a, a range of bat species, and they they do emerge surprisingly early. So shortly after the um, oh, and one particular species particularly good. At Rye Harbour is the Nathusius pipistrel. I hadn't heard of this bat until five or six years ago. Um, but anyway, they are quite tiny. So, next picture, please. That's the there, sorry. Yeah. So, that's um, one sitting on somebody's thumb. So, somebody's thumb is next, next click. So, they're 55 millimeters um, long. So, they're really quite small, just over um, two inches. So anyway, um, I can't hear these. Um, 
and you probably can't hear these, um, and they migrate a long distance and have used bats. So um, one of those arrows goes from Rye Harbour to Latvia. So they're a migratory bat and they overwinter um, in the very balmy conditions along the south coast here. So we can't hear them. This is what they sound like if you use a bat detector. And so, yeah. So we can use a bit of technology to hear them. And so um, this is a bat logger. Um, this is quite an old one that's probably cost about 1500 pounds, but you charge up the batteries, you put a memory stick, you put the lid on. Oh, first of all, you remember to turn it on. Then you put the lid on and then I stick it in my back garden. And then the following morning, I go out and bring it back, take out the, the memory card, download the, um, the recordings. It's all done automatically. And uh, hopefully we've heard bats overnight. So this is the, oh, and I can upload them onto a special um, online analysis tool on the BTO. And you can see I've been quite busy. I've been, I process 72,500 records of bats. But that's mostly from a study in 2015. So the results for this year, next one, Michael. So here we've got a graph. We all love a graph, don't we? So this is date along the bottom, the days of February, and the temperature is in the blue line. And you, if you follow the blue line, when we get to just about 11 and a half degrees centigrade at 7 p.m. of an evening, you start to get bats emerging. So the, the, the first, the left-hand orange column there represents the 21st of February. Next click, Michael. So it recorded two soprano pipistrels and two nephusius pipistrels, but they were both very early on in the evening. And then on the 23rd, there was a single of a Dorbentons, a little bit later, nearly eight o'clock. And then on the 25th, and the graph doesn't do this justice, it should go higher than it shows, um, there was a five sopranos, seven nephusius, five common pipistrels and two nocturals, but the activity was very brief. It was the warmest night of, of February and, and they were just active for um, not much more than 30 minutes. So they're, they're probably bur uh, bats that come out, see what the weather's like, see what's about. There were quite a few um, midges and, and, and small moths that night, but then they obviously decided they better go back. It was too cold. Um, and then it's got colder since the 25th and uh, I've heard nothing. So that's the end of my little February study of bats at Rye Harbour. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you. Uh, hopefully the sound played okay. Uh, James Thomas and said he couldn't hear the sound, but uh, um, maybe it's his hearing, Barry. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going to cast yeah. aspersions on James's hearing. <laughs> um, he also asked whether my, uh, my, my Long May You Run was a, was a Neil Young tribute, and it was uh, a Neil Young tribute. So well spotted there, James. Two points for you there for your Neil Young knowledge. Um, so insects are out and about as well. Uh, I, I photograph these uh, 42, 16 spot ladybirds. How many spots is that, Charlotte? A lot of spots. A lot of spots, exactly. Uh, th these were out on a, on a fence post when I was out, <laughs> out hiking. Uh, Angela photographed uh, this on her hire. Seems to know what it was. Uh, this, uh, she asked what it was. Yeah, and, and Mike, uh, Mike Mullis answered, uh, it's the uh, drone fly, uh, hoverfly. Uh, Aristalis 10x. So we're starting seeing uh, with bees and bumblebees out. Lots of photographs of bumblebees. I didn't put any photographs of bumblebees here. Sorry for any bumblebee fans. A lot of bumblebee photos on the Facebook page, uh, honeybees, as well as uh, overwintering hoverflies like this uh, uh, drone fly buzzing around. So it's all, it's all kicking off. It's all, there'll be bee flies out soon. It'd be fantastic. But there's been reports, also quite a few reports, uh, of, of these beauties. Now, these, of course, are hummingbird hawk moths. And there's a lovely video. Uh, sent in uh, by Rosemary up, up, up this place. Let's have a look. Go down here. That's that. Rosemary says, I saw this hummingbird hawk moth feeding from my Daphne today, just like a miniature hummingbird. Its wings whirring so fast and really loudly too. So I've never seen a real one before. Some of you have messages on robot ones perhaps in the past, but uh, amazing things. I, I think these, uh, some of them do go through the winter. Um, 
an overwinter here. They, they've started doing that in the milder winters. But really, cold snaps may, uh, they probably perish in cold snaps. So I think this, uh, the recent number people have seen probably come across as migrants. Uh, there's lots of hiring dust, wasn't there, coming north recently. So there's probably a bit of uh, warm air coming up and they, they probably moved over on that. But uh, lovely video there by uh, Rosemary. Thank you for that. So there's also lots of butterflies. Well, some butterflies. And before we start, I've got another poll question for you there because uh, I just wonder, where are we now? It's um, March the 4th, isn't it? So um, well, if, I, if I do do this, I've got another question for you. So uh, fingers on your buzzers, please. Um, how's a, who's seen a butterfly so far this year? So on March the 4th, have you seen, have you seen a butterfly yet? I've seen, I've seen one peacock very briefly, it flew past the garden, lady in the back, a lady in the corner of the room here seen three. James, how, how's, what's your butterfly count so far? Uh, it's two peacocks and three small tortoise shell. Okay, Charlotte, what have you got? I saw one, but I didn't get a good view, so I don't actually know what it was, but there was one. Okay, that's all right, that's all we need. And, and Barry? Basically, it's still on mute, Barry. One peacock, one red admiral. Okay, well, um, so let's look at the, uh, let's see, uh, let's see how the public, it's a bit of a Brexit vote for the uh, the butterflies here, 4852, I remember those days. Um, it's, it's the will of the people that uh, we have not uh, seen, uh, but most people have not seen butterflies yet, that's fair enough, but it's still very early, it's just turning to March, but uh, uh, on warm days, we are going to start seeing butterflies emerging from uh, hibernation. Uh, James, now what, what butterflies are coming out? What, what, what have we got to look forward to? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, the ones that we've just spoken about are really the ones that you're likely to see at this time. Um, and in much the same way that Barry was talking about, you know, sort of bats emerging on, on the really warm days, uh, of course, it's these kind of sunny days that, that are bringing these butterflies out, uh, potentially, you know, to sort of look for nectar. So, you know, the peacocks, uh, the small tortoiseshell, uh, the red admiral, of course, and the, and the brimstone, really the four um, that you're going to be seeing. And I always think it's amazing as well with the, with the peacock. I mean, it's just so incredible looking, isn't it? it it's kind of weird that it's, it's so common. Um, and of course, we all, you know, of course, we all appreciate it and think it's beautiful. But imagine if this was a rare butterfly. Uh, it's phenomenal. And it rivals, you know, most, most from the tropics, really, doesn't it? It's absolutely stunning. Gorgeous. Quite a ragged example. This one's lost. It looks yeah, like it's a it was brought up by Andrew a few days ago, and there's, uh, we also got a picture uh, from Nicola uh, in February of a Red Admiral you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, these obviously these these four, uh, you know, they're all overwintering in in Margo in adult form, um, and obviously that's that's quite different to a lot of other butterflies. So um, you know that that means obviously there's more potential for them sort of coming out on these nicer days. So these are the four to look out for, really. So a small tortoise shell is actually my my winner so far this year. I've seen more. Well, I haven't seen a lot, but you know I've seen more small to more more small tortoise shells by <laughs> that's a bit of a tongue twister that one uh, by one than I have peacocks. And okay. you know the thing I love about the small tortoise shell is it you know it's it's the butterfly that reminds me most of childhood because you know I always remember our garden uh, you know full of buddleia and absolutely alive with small tortoise shell. And of course that was back in the nineties when uh, you know small tortoise shell numbers were were sort of more than they are now. But they it does seem like anecdotally, like there's a, been a little bit of a resurgence as well uh, in recent times, because I've certainly seen more over the last couple of years. So very pretty butterfly as well. A lot of people have been seeing these, James. A lot of, uh, not me, but a lot of lucky people, even my neighbours have been seeing them in their gardens, not my garden, but- uh, Oh, really? Uh, brimstones. Lots of brimstones are out a few weekends back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I haven't, I haven't seen a brimstone either, but um, obviously the the beautiful males, they're kind of butter yellow colour. It's, it's uh, well, I mean, butterfly is uh, you know it's made for the brimstone isn't it and and of course this kind of cryptic uh, camouflage is perfect shape as well means that they can kind of nestle in you know amongst uh, sort of holly and, and, and bramble and what have you over winter uh, and keep a very low profile and I think you know it's the I suppose everybody kind of well it, people sort of think of the brimstone as being like the kind of a, the start of spring don't they but I mean, it isn't really, it isn't really, because they always emerge really before. You always see them before spring actually starts. This, this is this next butterfly, James. This is my, this is this is the day I say that spring has started when I see one of these. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now this is the this is the start of spring butterfly, definitely. So yeah, this is obviously a lovely male orange tip. Um, you know, they're a member of the white butterfly family. Uh, the females don't have these orange tips; they just have darker tips that are more kind of representative. Uh, of you know the more typical whites the uh, the large whites and the small whites 
really lovely butterfly and, and you know often you you sort of just get them wandering into your garden don't you really from uh, from april onwards so this is one to look forward to really in a few weeks time and then when it does arrive when you see the first one everybody then you can say that spring has yeah, truly arrived probably yeah. because it will be after the spring equinox so very nice lovely. thank you james thank you for that now um oh this uh I've got some fungi here which means i can uh uh, I do have my uh, a local a resident fungi expert and technical advisor, uh, Claire <laughs> Blanco, is over here. Um, nice picture of a stink horn, Claire. Um, this oh, doesn't, wow. yeah, there we go. I was about to say this reminded me of you, but that doesn't actually, uh, that's a very nice thing to say, but it reminded me to, to call you in because the, the next bit, the next part of the uh, tonight's, we we're about to finish, but we've got a, we've got a special, we've got a special. Um, film section now, and this is what I mucked up last time, so I probably need your help to actually uh, to get this working. So um, the thing with Zoom is, if, if you try and play some videos in embedded in the slide projection thing, it gets a bit, um, it gets a bit, a bit jerky. So uh, tonight we do have two films, tonight, two short films, about four minutes each, uh, a creature double feature, and it's, uh, it's, it's my uh, Michael Blanco Investigates Part 3 and Charlotte Owen's uh, in-depth a documentary on the wood mice in the uh, second part of an in-depth uh, 90s sitcom about wood mice in her greenhouse. So um, now, so it's the world premiere of both these, uh, so about four minutes each, and uh, grab some popcorn because, uh, yeah, now, just to tell you, before we start, um, now some of you may have seen my butterfly identification videos on YouTube, which I did back in the summer, way back in the summer uh, of 2020. So I think episode seven, I think, was the hair streaks and so this is a special bonus feature. This is a bonus uh, a feature on the DVD, if there was one. I've actually, I actually went looking for a brown hair streak female butterfly. I didn't see her. I did promise in the video, I think, I'll come back in the winter and look for her eggs on the, on the hedge, which is what I did in February. So, um, right, here we go. So, I, so bear with me, folks. So what did I do? I press my stop. No, did I stop sharing? No. Really? I, I end that. Yeah. yeah. So end that. I then, would stop sharing. Then I stop sharing. Right. Just uh, right, sorry, this is right. So do that now. Th no. There we go. Now, now, yeah, I, now I'll go here. Ready. Get the film ready. I close that. It's just hard work, right? So there, yeah. This is so exciting. I know. All right. Okay. Bear with me, Barry. Bear with me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then now, what do I do? Now I'm trapped. Look. Now where now do I go? It goes a suspense. Oh, through. there. So right. We're still right. We're getting there. Right. right. And, and now, then, I, then I go back to Barry, and then I share the screen. Right. That's it. Now go there. All right. Look at that. No. <laughs> Smoothly done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I, do I get a credit for cinematography on this? Yes, one? you do. I think you do. So I cleared a bit of filming here. So here we are. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, Searching for a Hair Streak in a Haystack. Back at my favourite blackthorn hedge in the uh, in the middle of winter here. Now, when I was last here in August, uh, I was telling you how the the female brown hair streak would come down from that ash tree up there, and she dance along this hedge, and she lay her little eggs on the blackthorn. And I hoped to find a female brown hair streak, uh, but I didn't. Uh, so I've come back on this lovely uh, winter's day, and I'm going to look for brown hair streak eggs. Now, as I mentioned, she loves laying her eggs. On the young growth and uh and i'm an expert at finding brown hair streak eggs so uh just give me a few minutes and i'm gonna find one for you now as i said back in august the trick to finding brown hair streaks and brown hair streak eggs is you've got to be the butterfly so imagine what the female butterfly would do she would try and find some nice young fresh growth for her eggs and also she want to find a nice warm place to help those eggs develop so try and find a nice south-facing edge and look down amongst the young growth. Now you're also going to need, uh, well, I'll need my uh, reading glasses and uh, one of these, magnifying glass. Right, so I'm ready to go, okay? Start the clock.
So although these eggs were laid in August, the best time to look for brown hair streak eggs is in the winter. Because in the winter, there's no leaves on the blackthorn and the white eggs stand out really well against the blackthorn twigs. Well, um, I must admit this hasn't turned out exactly as I had planned. I hope to have found you some brown hair streak eggs uh, by now. I've actually found nothing. Uh, nothing to do with my egg searching ability, which is still uh, excellent, of course. Um, it's more to do with the um, uh, the snow. The, the snow has affected my uh, my, my searching uh, here today. So, uh, and it's getting dark, of course. Now it's too dark uh, to search for the eggs. So, so what I'll do is I'll I'll head off. Uh, I'll come back in a few days, and then I'll find you some brown hair streak eggs. Okay, well, I'll give up. Uh, there's definitely not a brown hair streak egg to be found on this hedge. Don't know why that is. I'm guessing the female didn't lay any eggs here uh, last year, or maybe the birds came and ate them over the winter. It's nothing to do with my skills at finding brown hair streak eggs, of course. I'm an excellent brown hair streak egg finder. Or maybe it's just, just the wrong hedge. In fact, that hedge over there looks quite good. Maybe I'll try over there. There you go. Um, Anticlimactic, that wasn't it? <laughs> Just a bit pointless. Uh, Michael Blenko there, star of uh, Harry Potter, A History of Magic, uh, looking for uh, brown hair streak eggs. Not finding any, so it was a complete waste of time. It, was a waste of, it took me hours to do that, and a complete waste of time. But uh, um, so I, I, but there you go. But uh, I think maybe maybe next year I'll, I'll try it again. Now, um, we have one more one, one more film on the double feature here. Uh, you know what, I've got, Claire, how do I do this? I've got to press here, look. So I need to press this, so I need to stop this. It's really hard, folks. If you if not to, uh, so I go there. Yeah, press stop there. Well, yeah, stop sharing first. No, stop sharing. I'll stop share first. Right, stop there. Ah, oh, then then I then I go down here. Right, that's that. Then I stop there. Then I open Charlotte's video. All right, here we are. So we open uh, uh open here. Oh, wait a minute. Stop it. Stop it. And then we go back here. Now that's when I go over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I go up to Charlotte. I click on Charlotte. Um, there. Okay. And then I share screen. It was much more fun when there wasn't a pandemic on. It really was. Right, now go over here. Charlotte, any, do you to introduce, ask the director to introduce her? Uh, yeah, her, her well, video? I mean, this, this, this film might have a bit, bit of a running commentary, I think, just to kind of chat through what's going on. But people might remember from episode one, the mice are pretty used to having uh, peanuts in the greenhouse. So I decided to um, add a little challenge for them and see how they got on. Okay, let's, uh, let's roll tape. So you can see there, it's a stick with a load of Cheerios threaded onto it and it's dangling. So it also moves. And it's not entirely surprising that we were so suspicious of this from the start. Um, I mean, mice are naturally kind of neophobic. They're a bit wary of new things. So obviously this was, uh, this is the first time they've seen this weird object in their environment. And they've definitely never seen a Cheerio before. 
So yeah, and then it moved as well. So that was enough to, to put them off there. Now, there wasn't quite as much mouse activity this time around. Um, it was a lot busier when we filmed uh, earlier in the year. It was much, much colder. So the most, most we see is this pair. I'm not quite sure who's who at this point. It's a bit trickier to tell them apart. But on this night one, they were definitely much more interested in those peanuts and that feeder. That feed has been out there the whole time just to kind of keep them around, um, give them a little snack. So uh, yeah, they're still very, very keen on the peanuts and focusing pretty much all of their attention and quite a lot of effort into winkling them out and basically ignoring the Cheerios. So that's all we got for night one. And uh, after night two, it was really promising. I went to get the uh, memory card. Some of the Cheerios had gone, but nothing had recorded, a bit weird. Put it out again um, and still nothing had recorded, which is when I realized the batteries had indeed run out. Uh, so I put some more batteries in, topped up the Cheerios and hoped for the best for night four. Uh, and luckily, it was all up and running again. So we knew someone had been eating the Cheerios. We just weren't quite sure who. So at first, again, they're still pretty suspicious, having a little push of the stick, being a bit scared of the movement um, and being much happier, chewing away on the familiar peanuts. Um, it's probably the same two mice again, um, feeding away quite happily sometimes, but also uh, having a good old fisticuffs as well over the peanuts. This made me laugh because they split themselves off uh, and sat right at opposite ends there to eat the little crumbs they'd winkled out. And there was some quite impressive fighting that was caught on camera as well. Some real hands and face shoving each other around. Uh, so it's still quite entertaining. But they're more interested in fighting over peanuts until, and we can tell this one is a little stumpy, the one with the little shortened tail. So stumpy showing a bit more interest. And it's looking at, uh, like we might finally get a bit of cheerio interaction. <laughs> there we go, he's hit the jackpot. And once he gets a taste of these Cheerios, he really puts in a lot of effort <laughs> into grabbing them and pulling them off, just brute force. Get them off that stick and into his tummy. And he didn't let any of them go to waste. So there's a couple on the floor there. So he's winkled off one of them, hidden that somewhere, taken that one off as well. But ultimately, I think if we had to weigh up the two options, I think we can safely say that mice prefer peanuts to Cheerios. Although it did provide a little bit, a little bit of enrichment for them, perhaps. But they were there absolutely all night. So it's now sort of nearly half past six in the morning. So it's getting lighter. We've got a bit more detail um, in the video footage to get a bit of a better view of them. Um, tucking into a few more peanuts um, before having a little wash. Mice are nocturnal, so it's pretty much bedtime time for them now. Let's have a wash. And uh, off he goes. Brilliant. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> what you did. I don't know what I do. But now I'm lost. Now I don't know how to, how to get back. So I press stop share. Yeah? No, do I? I'm going to stop the film. So I've got my director behind me. Uh, do, you want, do you want to give me more, um, any more information while I'm just mucking around here on the... On the, on the batteries or the mice or anything? <laughs> yeah, I would say one piece of advice. So when Barry's already mentioned, make sure you turn the camera on, um, but also make sure the batteries are charged. That, that, that definitely helps. The first time it didn't work, I thought it might have been a weird glitch with the memory card, or maybe I didn't turn it on the second time. Yeah, dead giveaway, batteries, batteries were gone. <laughs> right. Okay, well, I think, wait a minute, I think I've done it. I think I've cracked, it's like some, like the Krypton Factor here or something doing this. Uh, is that right? Is that come back? Are we back? From current slide? Is that okay, James? It looks good. Look at that. Stressful. It's very stressful, folks. It's very stressful. It's much easier 
uh, when I was when I was filming the Harry Potter documentary. Uh, to be honest. Anyway, um, okay. Well, uh, I think we're pretty much uh, at the end of this, uh, this evening's presentation. So uh, I put a few photos at the end, some lovely photos uh, from the Facebook page, one by Bradley here. Uh, again, some swimmers underneath the uh, the Starling Murmuration uh, down there by the West Pier. What lovely picture? Image there. What picture? Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, that's where, that's where James is sat there right now. Look. Mm -hmm. And um, and just I love this picture here of the Chichester Harbour, uh, taken by Robin. Uh, some Brent geese uh, returning north, I guess. So uh, it's all changing. So spring's almost here, folks. Uh, really, uh, things are really changing now, warming up. And uh, I'd say it's been, a, it's been a long, cold, uh, lonely winter, but the sun's coming out. Nature's coming back. It's going to be uh, a fantastic march. Uh, so we'll be back in... Uh, We'll be back next month. There's uh, plenty more webinars. I've mentioned most of these webinars uh, throughout the talk this evening. So uh, there's plenty more to keep, keep us busy, uh, keep us distracted as we head through March. But there's going to be lots more wildlife. So make sure I get plenty of photos and plenty of sightings onto the uh, Nature Table Facebook page so I can use them uh, in, in our next webinar. Don't forget, of course, so Barry's already forgot. I say don't forget. Barry, Barry forgot already. He's already booked something else that evening. Um, but don't forget, Barry, you're doing a talk. Um, your big comeback on April the 6th. Um, Look at spring at Rye Harbour with some exclusive footage, as Barry mentioned. So exclusive, not not just any old rubbish from uh, from the last talk. It's a proper all, all new footage on his, on his new talk. So we look forward to that, Barry. April the sixth. Uh, we'll be back uh, the week after. On the, it'll be a Tuesday next time uh, because one of us will be going back to the gym. I'm not, I won't say who, who which one of us it is. Well, that's we should, we should, do, we should do a poll. Who's going to the gym from now on? Uh, who needs to go to the gym from now on? So um, uh, I won't say you have to guess and see that next time. We'll be back on Tuesday, uh, the thirteenth. Uh, in April. Uh, if you enjoyed the talk tonight, um, as we say, please consider making a donation to the Wildlife Trust. And if you're not a member, what's going on? Why aren't you a member by now? We've been doing, this is number 31. Um, I'm going I'm to start working out who's not a member, Barry. We'll, we'll go and knock on their door, shall we? Once this, these lockdowns lift, yeah. we'll work out who's watching this and isn't actually a member of the Trust. And we'll, all four of us will go around, we'll go and knock on your door and uh, <laughs> see what the problem is. So... <laughs> If you're not a member of the trust, there's a chance to uh, to avoid uh, that confrontation. Uh, you can actually join uh, uh, the trust uh, this evening. There'll be a link. Uh, there should be a link open in the page uh, when this finishes. So yeah, if you don't find the link, uh, if you go to the uh, the homepage of the Wildlife Trust website, uh, click on the hare's ears, it'll take you through to all the webinar extras and bits and pieces. So uh, and also a chance to catch up on the webinars you've missed. So. Uh, I think that's it. So I think I'd like to say thank you to everyone again for coming this evening. Thank you to uh, to James and Barry and Charlotte. So, and thank you to Claire for technical advice earlier on. And uh, thank you to you folks out there for your continued support of Sussex Wildlife Trust. And we'll see you at one of the webinars coming up this month. Or if not, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you in April. So uh, give us a wave, folks. And uh, take care, folks. We'll see you. Have a good month. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.